Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. We've got my friend Matt Little. How's it going? Good, man. Matt is a buddy of mine, a uh, major metropolitan SWAT sergeant. SWAT sergeant, man. yeah. Sorry. Okay. I didn't know what the correct term was. Green Beret, former Green Beret. I feel like, are you ever like not a Green Beret once you're a Green Beret? Like, do you still? Call I think yourself? you have a lifetime membership at okay. a club, so you can. Yeah, you know, I think so. You don't have to say like. No, I mean technically it's just the hat, but. All right, I, mean, I can buy one of those at like a freaking resale store. You could go to a pawn shop, probably. You think? People pawn their. Well, they don't pawn theirs. But oh, I'm sure, you know. It's stolen. And... Military surplus. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Not the same thing. So if I bought one, it doesn't get me in the club. <laughs> Especially if you get one of the ones, you know the ones that have little things sticking up in the middle? <laughs> wee wee. Yeah, you don't want one of those. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, that's funny. You and I met a few years ago. We were with uh, uh, Petros out at, yes. the, out at the site a number of years back doing some shooting and training. Yep. And uh, since have ended up members at the same uh, range, which yes. is cool. And done a couple training classes together. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Shot with Frank. Frank Proctor. Yep, yep. Done, a, done a few matches together. Yep. And then uh, most recently we hung out with uh, our friend Gabe White, which yep. is cool. So we talked. You've got some stories to tell. And this, the purpose of this podcast is that we impart the knowledge that men have learned on their journey. Knowledge worth passing on, though, I think is the important thing. And so you're eventually going to be branching off doing some training. I'd like to, yes. Yeah, yeah. once you're, you're at that point in your career. The name of the company is? Uh, it's going to be called Graybeard Actual. Which is also your Instagram handle. Yes, it is. Yeah. There's a cool picture of you with the uh, 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 Wolverine chop somewhere on there. Yeah, we actually got yelled at for that. Did you? Yeah, so the way that works, when you're deployed and in country, you're supposed to grow a beard because oh, a couple reasons. Like uh, part of it is. I have a quick question. Yeah. Go what ahead. if you were in Thailand? You probably wouldn't grow the okay. beard. Okay. Okay. So it's in yeah. certain countries. Yes. Okay. Yes. So one of the reasons is cultural, right? Because okay. you get more respect over there if you have a full beard because they think you're you're an adult, you're a man, you're wise. And part of it is so you can blend in at least from a distance. Okay. I mean, obviously up close, I'm not going to look like an Afghan. Sure. But if I'm wearing a similar uniform from a distance and I have the beard, it'll be harder to tell me apart from them. So you're not allowed to trim it or style it. It's supposed to be they just, don't do that. Right. It's just a beard. At the end of your tour, you have to shave it off. Because now you're back to exactly. the so, um, rules. My buddy, I'm not going to say his last name, but my buddy Dave, who was our senior medic, our Delta, is a huge comic book guy. Loves him, right? And he looks like Wolverine. And I don't mean the movie Wolverine. I mean, he looks like the comic book Wolverine. Yeah, yeah. Like this tall, this wide, stout, stocky, mm -hmm. big square jaw. So at the very end of our tour, since I'm taller and I had red hair back then before I was gray, I looked like Sabretooth, Wolverine's brother. Oh, yeah. So what we did was we, we cheated. We were about to shave everything off anyway. So we shaved it to just the chops. Uh huh. And we actually ran like that. And they, uh, yeah, they yelled at us for it. Yeah, you guys got a picture with some stogies in yep. your mouth and the freaking... Did you ever see that one, Drew? I'll have to send it. I'll have to send it to you for a thumbnail for this because it's funny. Yeah. Yeah, he, he does a better Wolverine than I did a saber tooth, but okay. it, it still looked pretty cool. Yeah, still the fact that it was two green berets deployed with that like hair. the mutton chops from yeah, hell. Yeah. yeah, they were like like down to here. <laughs> they were. They were. All right, so here's a question for you. There's a a million in three Green Beret SWAT cops that are starting training companies. That's an exaggeration. There is like 20 of them though. What do you do? What will you bring? What will people find with Greybeard Actual that maybe they wouldn't find elsewhere? Or uh, I don't know. I'll let you answer that. So, so here's kind of my thought on this, right? Is that I'm proud of my military service. I know plenty of guys who have done at least as much as me or more. Sure. Or far more. Um, I'm proud of what I've done in the police department. But mm -hmm. once again, there's a bunch of other guys that have done that as well. Um, I started competing a few years ago mm -hmm. in USPSA, and I'm proud of what I've accomplished there, but I'm not Ben Stoger, I'm not sure. Robert Vogel, I, I'm not a national champion in USPSA. No, but you are a master class I, I'm shooter. I'm a master class shooter, yeah. yes. But what 
I want to do is I want to take the lessons I've learned from all of those. And like, I did this a long time. And I, I had an idea of what I wanted to be from the start, like the skill level I wanted, mm -hmm. the ability I wanted, the experience I wanted. And it was hard to get there. There was, there was no roadmap. There was no, especially back then, because I'm pretty old. Like, you know, when I was younger, there was no, there was no training classes on the internet. Sure. There wasn't the practical shooting training group now, which is a phenomenal product from Ben where you can get all mm -hmm. kinds of knowledge. That knowledge wasn't available. Yeah. So a lot of what I did, there was a lot of false starts. There was a lot of detours, roads that went nowhere, things that I tried that didn't get me where I wanted to be. There sure. was no juice in the squeeze. Mm -hmm. And especially for the tactical side of the house, I'd like to kind of take what I've learned from all those areas and help the younger guys not take so long to get good. Okay. You know, give them mm -hmm. kind of shortcut their learning curve, give them just signposts and a way to train so they don't have to make the false starts and the missteps mm -hmm. and the paths that go nowhere on their journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the concept. That I'm makes good do. sense. I was talking about this with somebody recently. I remember late 90s, early 2000s, trying to find a class to learn some pistol shooting stuff. And I had to write a letter to the company and then had to go to the police station and fill out a form that they had mailed me to make sure that I was of good character and such. And then still yeah. had to call and talk to the guy and why do you want to do this? And like you said, now you can yep. you know, populate pages oh. of... I remember going to the gun shop outside of Fort Bragg and seeing all the old Lenny McGill VHS tapes. Oh, yeah. And watching those over and over again and like burning them out, watching them, pausing them in slow motion, trying to figure out how these guys were so good. Yeah, yeah. And it, it wasn't instruction, but it was the best you could do sure. at the time. Sure. And most of those guys, as people don't remember who these people were, they did what you're talking about. They had to yeah. sort should I wear my holster here? Should I wear it there? Yeah. Should I angle it like this? Yeah, what, what works better? Yeah. yeah, and you'd watch the progression of those shooting sports the things, everybody try it like this for a year, then over there, and yeah, yep. it's very interesting. And now it seems like we've kind of arrived at some, the ape, not we shouldn't say the apex, but for now we are kind of like, here's what you can do with the tools yep. that exist. It's been tried so much. It's kind of like any sport where if it's done long enough, the equipment has to surpass. Competition and I'm going to digress here a little bit, if that's cool. Sure, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. We're just chatting. So, like, I wanted to compete for a while before I did. Mm -hmm. And I had a bunch of guys telling me to do it. Um, Pete Milionis was one of them. Mm -hmm. um, Frank Proctor was Frank, another. Yeah. Yeah. I remember talking to Frank outside a place, a bar called The Office in Anison, Alabama, after a long day of shooting at Safalk, mm -hmm. about competition and what it had done for him and, and how good he was. And so... I knew I wanted to do it because I knew it would help me get better. I didn't realize how much value it was actually going to give. Mm -hmm. And I also, quite honestly, didn't realize how, how hard it was. Sure. Like, before I did it, like, I had a pretty good grasp on how good the greats were. You know, because you, you'd watch them on YouTube, you'd, yeah, yeah. You know, you'd watch the DVDs. I knew how good, like, the Rob Lethams and the Robert Vogels and the Ben Stagers were. I knew how good they were. What I didn't realize was how good the B-class guy that's a construction worker mm -hmm. is, how good the guys that do this for a hobby on the weekends are. Yeah. I mean, most of them would blow away with a pistol the vast majority of special operations guys sure. out there. Yeah. Because they, they've looked at it as a sport where fractions of a second matter, where accuracy matters at speed, and they've made everything so efficient. And... Not that a spec ops guy doesn't think accuracy No, no, of course. Yet. No, no, no. He absolutely does. I, I don't mean to say that. I knew you know that. I just yeah. want to make sure people listening understand that. And it's... It's huge how much value I found in that and how difficult I found it actually was. Mm -hmm. Before I did it, I kind of had this... And it's almost a little embarrassing to say it, but I kind of had a little bit of arrogance about it. Like I thought, I mean, I knew that the gamesmanship part of it was something I was going to have to learn, but I had a fair amount of confidence in myself as a shooter, right? And then I went to Alpha mm -hmm. to my first mismatch, which was the first match I shot, and just, I was amazed at how good yeah, what do you do everybody for work? was. I'm a computer programmer. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're just amazing. They're yeah, fast, yeah. they're accurate, they're moving well. And 
It was interesting to me how much I had to unlearn, how much actually wasn't efficient, even though I thought it was, mm -hmm. because of the ways of training, you know? And it's, it's not tactics, it's not tactical by any means, but efficiency is. Mm -hmm. Speed is, accuracy right. If I is. shoot you faster than you shoot me, that's a good tactic. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So you, know, you have to look at it through that filter. I mean, running a stage isn't tactical, but being efficient when you're moving tactically certainly is. Sure. You know? And it was just, it was amazing to me how much I learned just from doing that. Through that endeavor. Yeah. In the defense of you and people from your background, I've talked about this. One of my Ranger buddies, I was teaching him to shoot a pistol, and the guy with us is like, you're a freaking Army Ranger. You can't shoot a pistol? And he, like, slapped his hands down. He's like, everybody thinks that we're supposed to, like, be able to, like, fix airplane engines, speak 30 languages. Like, it's like it's not MacGyver or, or uh, uh, Mission Impossible. Like, he's like... I blew stuff up. That's what I knew how to do. Yeah. I blew stuff up. I could wire things up to make them disappear. Like, that's what I knew how to do. And you got to, like, still have time for the language stuff and yep. the uh, land navigation yeah, and all You've got to jump. You've got yeah. to rappel. You've got to climb. You've got to do all these other skills Medical also. Medical things. Sure. Yeah, and you've got to cross-train on everything. You've got to run. I ran all the radio systems. But even if I hadn't been the radio guy... The other guys have to know how to run that too. Sure. You know, we cross train with the medics. There's yeah, you're a lot not of just things. Shooting guns all day. No, no, you're not. But, but you are shooters. Sure. But it's not that that guy that's who who has the job at the uh, uh, computer store. That's his whole life. That A class yeah. shooter that comes home, loads ammo. Dry pro dry presses. He's not doing any radio work or ruck marching or right any right. of that stuff. Maybe he is, but I don't think he is. It depends on what he's into. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Though. Yeah. I'm making sure you guys understand there's a reason for that. The other thing that I really found was interesting too, after shooting the matches for a while, and this was a, a complete surprise to me, although it really shouldn't have been if I thought about it logically. I think this was once again, you're used to your own world and your own arena, and sometimes it's hard to see the benefits you can get from somebody else's endeavor that mm. will translate. Yeah, yeah. So, like, take, we'll take military CQB or, or police SWAT CQB for a minute, right? But it could just as easily apply to a civilian in their own home. Sure. Having to clear their own house. CQB movement is so drastically different than shooting a match. The timing is different. The pace is different. The priorities are different, mm -hmm. right? CQB movement didn't help me in matches. If anything, it actually made it harder for me to do well in matches. Sure. You're not just running blindly around a corner right. to engage a piece of cardboard. You're thinking, what's around that yep. corner? Sure. So for a long time, I was classified much higher than my performance. I'm still actually struggling to get to where I want to be because a lot of the habits I had developed, I had to, I had to make a different gear for myself. I had okay. to make a match gear for myself that was different than a tactical gear. Sure. And I'm still kind of sorting that out. Yeah, right? yeah. But what I found is the better I got at the match gear, at the match pace, the better my CQB got. And it was all one way. It was all unidirectional, right? Hmm. It, um, it all flows one way. It flows straight from the matches of CQB, not the other way. And I realized what it was, was that I'd learned to look at things with a high priority for efficiency. And that changed the way I looked at breaking a threshold or breaking a corner or movement in CQB. It's still a slower pace. It's still a more thoughtful pace mm -hmm. than shooting a match. It's not just how fast can I right, make the exactly. wheels. I mean, there's times when you have to, to move out, but they're, they're pretty rare, actually, when you're working with a team. It's usually a very smooth pace. But efficiency matters. And little things like, like in a match, when you break that vision barrier, because it's not really cover, it's a vision mm -hmm. barrier. When you break that vision barrier, you want to already have the sights lined up on the target you're going to shoot, right? So that's very different than, you know, the old bringing in here, compress ready and pie the corner, mm -hmm. bit, right? But say you're breaking the threshold for CQB and you've got to hit that hard corner and clear it. What's better? To clear that hard corner with the muzzle of your weapon already up in the corner the moment it breaks the threshold so that you at least have a fighting chance mm -hmm. if the guy is waiting for you there and has a drop on you? Or the old way of doing it where you're thinking about hitting that corner but you're not looking at those fractions of a second, mm -hmm. right? 
And, and I can't really take credit for this because if you look at like the guys on the SIF teams or the guys in the SMUs and the guys teaching Safalc and Safartec, this kind of is the new standard. So it's not like I came up with something original all on my own, but I understood why the standard was changing. Now. Sure. And now like teaching my guys at work, like now I could kind of coach them on ways to move that would maximize their ability to prevail because mm -hmm. you're, you're slicing away those thousands of a second where you're not hitting your responsibility yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of, it was really eye-opening for me. Like that was, it was one of those moments where kind of the light bulb comes on and you have that Zen Satori moment mm -hmm. where things kind of make sense a different way. And it, it completely changed the way I look at movement across the board, like not just in a match, but also for civilian self-defense, for CQB, for you know, two partners in patrol who have to clear a structure together, which is hard, just two mm -hmm. guys. Because it gives you that, that ability to reverse engineer the movement and make it as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's completely because of the matches I did, because you're trying to shave off those thousands of a second that separate yeah. you from the next guy. Seems like everybody I know that came from a special operations background that has done matches tells people, go competitively shoot. Uh, Mike Pannone comes to mind, Frank Proctor you listed, Larry Vickers, one of the founders of, of IDPA. Uh, 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 what's his name? The other IDPA, ha Ken Hackathorn. Yeah. You know, all those guys, they all, and of course, Colonel Cooper, they all realized it's, I, th I think Ron Avery calls it bloodless combat. You know, he's another GM. Well, that's the thing too is, and this, this could just be me. It might be different for other people. But at least people wired like me, I think it's probably going to be pretty universal. Is, you know, because I've, I've been to Afghanistan, I've been to Iraq. I've been in confrontations as a cop. Mm -hmm. The amount of stress I feel shooting a match is way higher for me. I've heard that from a bunch of people. Do you think that that's because of the people watching? It's because of your peers. Yeah. You don't want to look bad in front of your peers. Well, don't you want to not look bad in front of your peers when other people are shooting at you too? It's different. Is it? It's, okay. Um, there it's all about whether the good guys win. Yeah, yeah okay. You know what I mean? Like there's some not, acceptable I, I don't want to say that. I mean, you, you've got to be wired tight. You've got to have your game on, no okay. doubt. And the better you are, the better chance your team has of prevailing, although nothing's a given. Sure. You know, bullets, bullets don't care what kind of tab you have. What I meant by f is, in a match, it's you against cardboard targets. So anything yes. that goes awry is clearly your fault. Yes, not yes, like the cardboard yes, yes, that's yeah. it, that's yeah. it. And it's also, at the match, like, if you and your team are, are doing a hit, right, everybody's doing their job. Sure. But when you get up to a match, Everybody's looking at you. Right. What's he going to do? And it was, it was interesting for me because because of my background, I did well in classifiers. So I came in and I classified really well. Okay. Like I made A right off the bat. I made master in very short order. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't shooting as well at the matches as my classification. And I remember the first time I was at a match and people started to kind of notice, you know, that the new guy was was moving up in the ranks. And usually to match, like everybody's, there's a lot of ball busting, everybody's mm -hmm. talking smack to each other, yeah. laughing, joking. And then certain people get up and everybody's quiet. And we were doing one stage, it was a turn and draw, right? Just a local match. And I remember I got up and all of a sudden everybody stopped talking. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, they're all watching me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, damn it. <laughs> I better not screw this. Go about your business. Yeah, yeah. Go, go back to messing with each other. Um, so, and obviously that was just a local match, you know. I'm, but still. But, but it's just, it's funny how much pressure that puts on you mm -hmm. and how beneficial I think that can be as a carryover as well. Sure. And here's another carryover. Not just movement, not just the stress, but becoming acclimatized is the best way to put it. You start thinking about thousands of a second separating you from the other guy. You start shooting at that pace where, you know, the sights are a blur, but you're interpreting the blur mm -hmm. as best you can, mm -hmm. right? And that's the pace you have to live at. 
to do well at a match. You start processing at that speed, and this is something I've stolen from Frank Proctor. He's, he's big on processing, right? Mm -hmm. Processing the input. You start processing at that speed, and then you go back to CQB speed or tactical it's like, speed, <laughs> it's so slow for you. Yeah. And it's, it's a really neat thing, because then like running CQB with the guys at work, after shooting the matches, everything now seems so mellow. Mm -hmm. It seems so slow and so comfortable because you're used to operating at a faster pace. Yeah. And you don't want to operate at that faster pace for the real thing because that's not tactical like we talked about. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You have mm -hmm. to make decisions. You have to process the environment. You have to work together as a team. And you can't do that at that, that edge of riding off the rails pace you need. Yeah, yeah. But once you're used to living there and you come back to the tactical pace, you're so much more comfortable there. Sure. And that's, I think... It's like walking with a weighted vest on and then taking, taking it, it off. off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or like uh, those, the swim trainers where they have to swim faster than they can swim. Mm -hmm. They get pulled along. Mm -hmm. Or the sprint trainers where they got the yeah, bungee yeah, and they yeah, get pulled yeah. along. And then they get rid of that and now regular sprinting. W waiting your bat, warm exactly. out for batting practice. Exactly. Yeah. So it's the same thing. It's like all of a sudden now your mind is processing all the information so much faster and it opens you up. Mm -hmm. Now you can see all the variables, all the things going on. We were talking about that with Gabe when he was just here. Yep. And the shots seem so much easier now because you're used to taking shots so much faster. Right. And I think that's a huge benefit as well. Which, as you and I know, people that actually push themselves to those kinds of levels is very few people. I think most people don't understand what they're physically capable of. And if you're not, it's funny because we might throw names out and most of the people that listen to this will have no idea who some of those people are, but what is there? How many GMs are there in the world? Like 400 or something? Maybe it's not a yeah, lot. It's just, yeah. yeah, there's a handful and then like master class, something like that. And guys like say, oh, okay, he's a master class shooter. Well, that's like less than like my daughter's high school class and the whole planet, you know, like, like that's a, that it, it, and folks, I had a guy tell me I was with Eric camps, a friend of ours that you guys have seen on the podcast here, Eric's a GM and somebody was saying, uh, uh, like, I'm sure there's people out there that could shoot at that level that just don't train in that genre that, you know, if you put them in the match and I'm like, no, no, like there's, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I no. don't think so either. I mean, it, like there's not some farm kid somewhere. It's not a movie where you could give him a gun and he'd run through a stage like like Ben or Les or something and and just burn it down. And nobody knew he could do that. No, it's it's not one of the things that was eye opening. Actually, it's you don't understand really. Like you can't. You may understand it rationally. You might be able to conceptualize it, seeing a video, seeing how somebody does it. But until you try to do it, realizing just what is required mm -hmm. consistently. Yeah. That's the key. It's consistent. Yeah. Oh, and that's, yeah, we, that's yeah. the flip side of this. That's where you can actually, you can impact yourself negatively if you're not careful. Sure. And I did this to myself. I was actually Eric, and I had a race to GM, and we were pushing so hard. I remember last year, yeah. Yep. And... I pushed so hard for so long that I actually damaged my shooting for a bit because I had made it where everything I did was the push. Mm. And you can't do you that. You never dialed it back. I never to... dialed it back, yeah. And it was, it was like rolling the dice. You know, when the dice, came, when the dice came upright, it looked really cool and it worked really well. But the problem is you You're can't control holes and ceilings. You can't and... Well, no, not that bad. Not that <laughs> no, bad. I know, I know. <laughs> but you can't control where the dice land. Sure. You know, and it's not. You have to learn, and like, you got to temper it. You have to learn kind of what pace you're operating at. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think as police and military, and a lot of times too, as like civilian tactical shooters, I think we make the mistake the other way. You know, you're accountable for every round, right? You have to be accurate. Accuracy is, is what's most important. And it's not wrong. But the problem is if you never train and allow yourself failure, if you never push in training to the point where the things come off the rails, you'll never get the real speed mm -hmm. and the real ability. Because you have to have that failure point. You have yeah. to figure out, okay, why did it fail? What do I have to do to fix it? Where do I go? So that's one side. You don't want that. In training, you have to allow yourself to push beyond what is stable, 
beyond what is repeatable, beyond what is consistent. But you have to make it a conscious thing. Mm -hmm. And then your, your natural mode has to be that letting your ability to dictate your shooting, letting what you see dictate the speed you shoot at and how you make the shot. That has to be where you live. Then you push to get better. Yeah. And then you bring it back. And like at work, I always did it with my guys. I would always end our practice sessions with an accuracy intensive drill. Mm -hmm. Like we would start out with something accuracy intensive to kind of build and warm up. Then I'd work with them on speed and skill development and run them until they ran off the rails. Run them until it was a train wreck. Then at the end, I'd dial them back down mm -hmm. and make it where every round has to count before I'd let them go back out because you don't want them to go on the street and the last thing they did was the fastest yeah. build drill they could do and they had right, two misses. Right, right. You know, you don't want that. But for myself, I didn't heed my own wisdom for a while and I was trying so hard to get better, so hard to get faster that I didn't rein it back in enough. Mm -hmm. And then I had to spend a better part of the last year kind of fixing that, mm -hmm. kind of pulling back on the reins and getting back into that point where I knew what was comfortable and repeatable, what I could do every time, and then push when I consciously chose to push. And that is a danger you have to watch out for. If you get so caught up in, because it's addictive, right? You get up there and you have that, that great run especially in practice where nobody's watching and you're not stressed. Sure, sure. You know, and you have that great run that looks as good as anything you see anybody else do. And you're like, hey, I can do this. No, you really can't. <laughs> <laughs> you, but what that does tell you is you physically have the yes. capability to sort it out. It's just getting well, there where it's re repeatable. The gateway to doing it all the time is to do it once. Right. And then the next step is to do it, you know. Now you start to believe. One time out of 10, then one yeah. time out of five, then one time. Right. And then you get to where you can do it all the time. But a lot of people, and like I said, in the past, myself included, it's easy to get addicted to that and to make the mistake of, well, I know I'm capable of it, so I'm gonna push and I'm gonna do it. Capable of it when everything hooks up is different than capable of it all the time. Mm -hmm. And you have to know what you can consistently do. And it's a moving target because it's always changing. You know, you're always pushing and then evaluating where you are and then pushing and evaluating where you are and kind of dragging the consistent up with the outlier mm -hmm. until you get your skill to kind of the limit of what it can be. So it's for tactical shooters, you have to be careful of that, I think. If you, if you push too much all the time, you start to get too on the edge. Mm -hmm. Which begs the question then, at what point is enough enough? Like, I know many police officers that have saved their skin with their skills that would walk into a USPSA match and be the lowest man on the totem pole. Or uh, I've had a handful of students that have been involved in self-defense shootings and are just average everyday plinkers. So they didn't have these amazing high level skills, but it was enough to save their skin. I've actually like, I've thought about this a lot actually. And it doesn't really, I'm wired a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Like I want to see how far I can take it. Sure. Like it's no longer about how much do you need to prevail yeah, in the what, situation. What's, what's the what can apex I do? of what, my yeah, physical what, limitations? Where can I take it? How fast can I run a mile? How much weight can I dead? Exactly. Yeah. 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 But I think, I think for most people, I mean, there definitely is an amount that is enough. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be, you don't need to be a GM or an M by any means, mm -hmm. I don't think. Especially if you have a good mindset, you're aware, you, you have all the other pieces, because there's a lot more to it than just shooting. Sure. Although if you can't hit what you're shooting at fast enough, none of the rest of it matters. Right. If it comes to that, mm -hmm. I should say, unless you can avoid it ahead of time. And I don't really know what the answer is, mm -hmm. but I think it's a higher level of skill than most people think. Yeah, I would agree with that. When you, I only brought that up not to say, like, don't push yourself because right. it's not needed, but it's what we're talking about with the competition stuff is beyond that whole genre of self-protection. For most people, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think... Um, now, that said, I want to add one more thing. I, you could then easily go down the rabbit hole of, is there ever a time that not being better with my weapons is a detriment? Like, I could never be too good. Okay. Well, and I think there's different answers too. Like, take a SWAT team, mm -hmm. right? 
And like, I'm on a full-time team. I'm gonna have some fudge. I still don't think we get enough time to train. No? You know, we don't get as much time to train as a military unit that is analogous to us would get. But it's far better than the average policeman. You know, it's a whole different level, mm -hmm. right? And then, how good is good enough for someone who's in that line of work? Because you can't look at just the average situation, right? Mm -hmm. You have to look at the outliers because that's what a unit like that is for. They're for the outliers. Mm -hmm. So if it's the worst possible day, the worst possible scenario, how good do you want your guys to be for that? Mm -hmm. So that's one answer. And I mean, obviously, they're not all going to be GMs or MS either, but you want them to be good shooters, mm -hmm. you know, far better than the average self-defense person, I would argue. Mm -hmm. Military, same even more so. Mm -hmm. So, but like take, take your average civilian who carries, who wants to defend themselves. I would say that for most situations, pretty good is probably more than good enough because you're not usually fighting at somebody who's trained. Mm -hmm. Your awareness is gonna count for more. Your tactics is going to count. As long as you can put the rounds where you need them and do everything else right, you're probably going to be okay. Mm -hmm. But once again, I would look at the outliers at least a little bit, mm -hmm. right? You know, what is what is the maximum amount of skill I might need and something I could reasonably, in the worst possible scenario, see? Right? You know, maybe active shooter at my kid's school. Sure. Maybe something going on in a mall. Maybe, um, you know, some bad guy trying to do harm to a lot of people. How good do I want to be in that situation? People running around, people screaming, crazy, a lot of movement, trying to protect my family and other people. So you kind of take that into account. And then I would argue that because skills degrade under stress and because you're not talking about shooting in a sterile environment, mm -hmm. I would want to build in a bit of a buffer. Sure. And I don't really know what the answer is for that. I mean, you know, how much skill do you need for that? Yeah, it's not something we can say. If you can yeah. draw and shoot a no. dinner plate at 10 yards in two seconds, you're good to go. Yeah, yeah. Until somebody comes up and sticks a shank yeah. in you. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those where I don't know if there is a definitive black and white answer. Mm -hmm. I would just say that if you feel like you're good enough, I'd probably try to be a little bit better. Yeah. You know, but you don't have to... You obviously don't have to compete on a national level or be a master class shooter. Mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to do that, I don't think. But you need unconscious competence in the basics. I like that. I try to compare it when, I, when I've got students, because we work a lot with average everyday citizens. I compare it to when they get in their vehicle. You, know, you, you see people when they don't, even cops, when they don't shoot a lot, you watch them fumbling around. There's not yeah. good systems to how they load or manipulate yep. the gun. And I compare it to when you get in your car, I'm not telling this to you, but you guys, like you don't think about where's my key go. You get in, you throw it in, you do whatever you're going to do with the controls. You put your seatbelt on, you're not figuring out where you immediately are able to shove the buckle together and you put it in gear and you hit the levers and switches and it's all subconscious what you're talking about well how many times do you leave work and you've had a, a busy day or a bad where are you day going with this and you drive home and you don't remember a thing about the mm -hmm. drive but you drove home safely you traversed 20 miles 50 miles you were safe you were competent you were mm -hmm. aware on a subconscious level mm -hmm. but consciously you were thinking about somebody else mm -hmm. and here's the thing especially and remember that I kind of come from the background of, of armed professionals. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have a little bit of a different take on it than just somebody who's CCW. Mm -hmm. But if someone can be at that point of unconscious competence with their weapon, they don't have to be a race car driver. Mm -hmm. You know, because a GM is yeah, they're a, a national Mario race Andretti. car driver. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have to be a race car driver. But if they can be at the point with their firearm, that we all are with our car, mm -hmm. where we can drive home and not think about the car at all mm -hmm. and still be safe, that allows them to think about the tactical situation. Right. To think about the priorities of work. Why is that car backing up into the road? Exactly. Yeah. So if I don't have to worry about running the gun, if I can instead solve the problem, mm -hmm. then I'm way ahead of the power curve of the other guy who's probably thinking about running the gun. Mm -hmm. You know, then I can think about, hey, you know, where's a good backstop if I have to make the shot? 
or the round's not gonna go hit somebody else. Mm -hmm. Where can I get my family behind cover, not just concealment? How do I fix this guy and flank him so that I can take him out because he's killing people? Mm -hmm. You can think about those problems because you don't have to think about how to reload your gun. Sure. And unfortunately, or not unfortunately, but the fact of that is you can't get to that point, just like you can't get to that point in your vehicle without logging miles. Yep. You got to go do it, run the ammo through the gun. You can't go shoot 50 rounds every six months. No. It takes time behind the gun. And not just dry fire either, which is important, but you have to go do it and make gun smoke. Dry fire is a huge tool. Um, I, I mean, every competitor dry sure. fires every day. Everybody competitor who's serious, dry fires most every day. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's not, it's a phenomenal tool, but you have to be used to the recoil. You mm -hmm. have to be used to all the things that happen when you're having that little explosion go off in front of your face that you can't get used to in dry fire. I actually tell students not to dry fire until they've learned how to shoot their gun. Because what happens, you know this, they're dry firing stupid shit that, that, that doesn't or shouldn't be done with the gun when it's loaded. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. And then like yes. they don't, because they haven't done it enough with a real live loaded weapon, they don't understand why they shouldn't or should be doing something. You know, you see guys like doing weird, you see people post videos of just weird things that they're dry firing. You're like, why are you doing that? Like, what are you, what are you actually enforcing or reinforcing right now? I, I'm a huge believer in dry fire. And I would say that if, if someone who doesn't compete wants to dry fire, there's some really good books oh, yeah. and videos out Benz. there on it. Ben's. Ben's are phenomenal. Yeah. And that's actually the ones I was going to recommend. And yeah, they're for competition. It doesn't matter. Shooting is shooting. You can layer the tactics on top of the shooting, but if you can't shoot, it's not going to be enough if you need to shoot. Yeah. So I would definitely buy Ben's books and actually do what most people don't do which is actually read them and follow the directions. <laughs> right, don't just turn to the page yeah. with, the, with the... Most people most people buy Ben's books and they look at the books and they flip through them and they go, this is really cool. I'm going to set it on my bookshelf and if I pick it up every couple of days by osmosis, I'll get better. Mm -hmm. No, you actually, gotta it's it. a training program. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a phenomenal training program, but you have to actually read it and put it into practice and pay attention to what he's saying yeah. because what he's saying will make you so much better if you do. I think he's pretty much codified the best version of dry fire practice? I think so too. Mm -hmm. um, I really do. Especially because it's so broad. Like Steve Anderson's books are good. Yeah. But Ben's stuff handles a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different mm -hmm. things. And he's got a way of imparting the information that I think is really solid. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can't recommend his stuff enough. Like if, if you guys don't know who he is, he's a multi-time national champion. World. World two. World yeah. Two, yeah. True though, yeah, and he's kind of self-taught. Yeah. It's cool, his first book, and I don't want to make this about Ben, but if you read what he's talking about, actually read the book, he talks about, he goes to a match and was like, hey, I think I could be good at this, how do I do it? And he broke down, he went and looked at dudes that were really good, here's how fast Bob shoots, here's how fast John yep. shoots, that's what I gotta do if I wanna beat them, and bro broke it down bit by bit. It's actually even more impressive than that. It's, um, he did the math and figured out how fast he needed to do everything. Mm -hmm. And how have fast I got to draw and get yep. a hit, how fast I have to reload. And this is before you could find this stuff the way you could now. He mm -hmm. like did research on all the classifier scores on yeah. the internet, on USPSA, and like actually reverse engineered it. Figured out what the high hit scores were because they weren't publishing them then. Mm -hmm. High hit factors, I mean. Reverse engineered it, and then he just went and practiced by himself until he could do that consistently. Mm -hmm. And he actually came in as a grandmaster, yeah. which is like unheard of. Yeah. So but he did all the work oh, yeah, to no, get he, him there. He worked yeah. very hard. Yeah, no, he worked really hard. Like a whole winter of dry fire leading yep. up to the first season. Yeah. yeah, no, it's what he did was incredibly impressive. And he's a, yeah, I, I can't recommend the books enough. He's yeah. a phenomenal coach. And if you want to dry fire, read his books. You touched on a point there. It's analogous to everything in life. You can't just take the information and not do something with it. I've got a library upstairs of stuff that I'm sure there's 50 books up there I've never read. And they've done nothing for me because I've never read them. And not, not, not even read it, but then applied the stuff, yeah. Well, it's like, uh, and this is not a knock on anyone. This is more like an entreaty to people to do things a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of times I see this with police, especially, to a lesser degree with military. And my impression is a lot of people who are civilian tactical shooters kind of do the same thing. Mm -hmm 
what we tend to do is we'll go to training courses, whether it's an SF guy going to Safalk every year before he deploys, doing his train up, or it's you know the SWAT guy who's doing the training on the team and he's going to training courses the department sends him to. Sure. Or it's the tactical shooter who'll do you know four training courses a year, which is a lot. That's a lot. And he'll shoot once a month or so. If you want to truly be good at something, the training course is not where you get better. Amen. Like, uh, I come from a martial arts background before I did any police or military or anything else. I started as a kid, right? And in martial arts, you know, there are seminars you go to. You know, you go to tournaments to fight, you sure. go to seminars to train, but the seminars aren't your training. Like, I've met a few guys as an adult that were into martial arts and would go to a bunch of, you know, everything from Muay Thai to JKD to Filipino martial arts, they go to all these seminars, but they wouldn't train in between. And there's a bunch of policemen who, even policemen who will pay for their own training courses, which is a great thing. I mean, it, it, it's good that you care about it. It's good that you want to mm-hmm. be good at it, enough to pay for it out of your own pocket. But going to the training class is not where you get better. Yeah. You go to the training class and you learn what you need to work on and how to work on it with that instructor's take on it. And you take something from that and you come back and you train. Yeah. You know, if you look at anybody who's good at anything, they don't just go to four classes a year. They train on it, they work Mm -hmm. on it, they Mm -hmm. develop it on their own. And I think a lot of times we do ourselves a huge disservice, and that's across the board. We go to these classes and we expect to get better in the class. Yeah, yeah, you're there to learn some new information. Yes, you have to learn a different way of, something you can take from that class and bring back and work on it on your own. And that, that's how you get better at anything. You don't see a musician, you know, practicing one weekend every couple months. Right. You know, and they're they practicing all the time. Themselves. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and once again, how good is good enough? I'm not saying that you have to be as intense about it as I am. I'm not saying that you have to do it hours every day, but you have to have a regular training schedule if you want to be good at something. Sure. And what you have to do is you have to balance that with the rest of your life. You know, how good do I want to be? How much effort do I have to put in? And how efficient can I be with the effort? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. how efficiently can I train? You mean so when I go to the range to train and I end up spending an hour of my two hour training session trying to get the perfect 30 second Instagram clip, stuff like that, that's inefficient. I'm, that, was, that was kind of a joke, but a dig at myself. Um, well, what are you training for? Oh, well, that's I'm, no like today. I had a really good plan, except I was what I was training, and it was uh, some stuff with the pistol. I'm like, hey, this is actually like a pretty good little Instagram clip. I'm going to film it. So now I derailed. I was conscious of yeah. it. So, but it's a, it's an analogy. I was conscious of it and was able to get done what I needed. But I had planned what I was going to do for two hours, of which 45 minutes became some Instagram. Well, but but think about this though. How do we train? Like, what's the mechanism for training for anything, right? I think as adults, a lot of us, either we no longer understand, or if we were unfortunate enough to never have an endeavor as children where we learned how to practice, Mm -hmm. we don't necessarily understand how to practice. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be able to have deliberate practice. Yeah. Like, an athlete has a training plan. Right. You're not... You don't just walk in the gym and start throwing weights around. No, no. Because you have to have a plan. Yeah. You're, you're planning on getting better. So what are my weaknesses? How do I bring them up? How do I consolidate my strengths and improve them too, but not at the point of where I'm neglecting my weaknesses sure. so that I can't be well-rounded? And if I'm training to be at a certain point, by the, like say by the end of, we'll, we'll go back to competition. So say by nationals next year, I want to be at a certain level. What do I have to do between now and then to get there? Because it's not going to happen on its own. Sure. You know, you have to sit down and or a defensive shooter, right? I want to have, decide for yourself how good good enough is. Yeah, standards. How good do I need to be to be good enough where I'm comfortable carrying a gun and protecting my family? What am I trying to accomplish? And you don't have to make it up on your own. You could take the Gabe White standards. I mm-hmm. think those are good. Take Gabe's standards, and if you can do those at his light pin level, that's probably good enough mm-hmm. for just about anything you'd ever have to do. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't need the turbo. If you can just do the light pin, you're He's saying that because I'm just a game. light pin kind of guy. <laughs> you didn't get to do all of them, though. No, I did it this past. This, yeah, I ran, you got to do yeah. all of them? Okay. Yeah. yeah, but you had like, you're shooting it with I, a I, subcompact gun. I can't, I, I don't, 
I just don't shoot that awful fast to shoot those standards. I'm always just a tinch below. I did shoot it with a 365 till it blew up. You were shooting with a subcompact gun. I was impressed. It did it. But my point was, is I'm only a light pin guy. I'm only a light pin guy. <laughs> that's not why I brought it up. It really isn't. But, uh, <laughs> I know, I'm just kidding. No, but you're right though. Those, that's a yeah. good, that is a good baseline. Yes. Uh, the, yeah. the standards. Like that's, that's a good one to pick. That's an easy one because the work's been done for you. Mm -hmm. He's done a bunch of research on it. And you, you take his standards are on the internet. Yeah. Look at him. You don't have to go to his class. Bill drill, double Although bill I, drill. I recommend his class. Yeah, his class is awesome. But you don't have to go to it. Just look at the standards and develop your training program around what you want to be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, which coincidentally, he came up with those standards by looking at what guys like uh, JJ Rakaza and those dudes like Ben and others, yeah. what their times were and said, okay, if they can do that, what can I do? And then made that the standard, yep. so. You know, or take something else, take, I like the fast, but I like having multiple standards. Sure, yeah, instead. it's just but one. If, but if that's what you wanna take, take that. Take yeah. something that you think, if you're at a certain level at, that's good enough, and then develop your training plan around that. Mm -hmm. But it's gotta be conscious, it's got to be deliberate, it's got to be planned. You're not, like, like take an example, as adults, how do we try to get better at playing tennis? We go play games of tennis. Go play tennis, yeah. That's not how you get better at tennis. You right. get better at tennis by doing the drills, doing the training, doing the workouts, doing all the stuff you do to develop the attributes right. that how a coach do, would have a tennis player do. How do I explode do. to move from side right. to and side? And I can't, I can't play tennis, but no. it's just an example. I can't play tennis either. I'm no good in a tennis skirt, though. I've heard that. <laughs> I have. So, so, like, that I think is something we do ourselves a big disservice as, as adults across the board. Sure. You know? I got a family member that goes golfing 50 times a summer. Yeah. And he sucks. And I don't golf, but I always hear about it. Oh, I shot, you know, I was the low guy on the, but like I've said to him, why don't you go see like a golf pro and like, you know, I, I don't know anything about golf, but I hear about it at family functions. Well, I, I, I play enough. Yeah, but you suck. Like, and you don't know what's wrong with you and you spend thousands of dollars a year and he buys all the gadgets and things to try to get better. Well, like go back to the martial arts analogy, right? Like when I was a teenager, I competed in martial arts. Okay. I fought nationally. You don't get better. Time out. Dance off is not a martial art. We thought it was. <laughs> we thought it was. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> so, yeah, I can't. I can't top rock either. No. Gabe can, but I, I can't, can't do it either. Yeah, I can't do no. it. No. So, it would have been cool to be able to break dance. Yeah, I don't. I, I never. I never tried skills. No, I never tried. No. It would be kind of neat. It's like a lost art now. Something you should learn. It's like, I don't have time. No. <laughs> <laughs> don't want it that bad. Don't want it that bad. So well, that's a whole other topic, how bad do you want it? But anyway, so people who don't box, who don't do jiu-jitsu, mm -hmm. who don't fight Muay Thai, who don't do karate, who don't, you know, who don't do a combative sport, they think you can get better at fighting by sparring, by doing the actual fighting. Mm -hmm. That's not how you get better. That's how you test your training right. and see where you're at now. Right. Competitive shooters. There's a lot of competitive shooters who think you get better by shooting matches. And that's the same thing. There's tons of dudes that show up and they're always yep. and they're just a sling lead. Oh, it's a good time. Now, I'm not saying you don't get better in some things. You get better at the mental side of things, at handling mm -hmm. the match, at the match management. Sparring, you get better at what it actually develops, but you're not going to technically get any better right. at either one. How you throw your punch is not developed yep. in the sparring. Right? No. Your draw, your reload, your movement, your, your shots at speed aren't going to get any better at the match. Mm -hmm. Right? Your technique and your physical attributes aren't going to get any better while you're sparring. Whether you're a boxer or a fencer, it doesn't matter. Any combative sport, right? Those are the test. You don't get better doing that. If you're a tennis player, I'll have to ask, we got a guy who's a tennis pro who's now shooting matches, I'll have to ask him. But I'm pretty sure he'll say the same thing. Mm -hmm. That you don't get better playing tennis by playing tennis. Sure. You get better by doing all the work you have to put in, and then the game is the test. Oh yeah, that gentleman that was at the, I yep. remember that, yeah, yeah. So, supposedly he's really good. Mm -hmm. But, so that's kind of the thing, is like everybody looks at it backwards. They're trying to get better at the event by doing the event. Right. That's not where you get better. You get better by putting in the work ahead of time. So you've got to look at your training like you're an athlete. 
And that's the same thing as if you're protecting your family. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to look at it like you want to be a world-class athlete, but you need to be good enough mm -hmm. for whatever that means to you, whatever your definition of good enough is, figure it out, and then how much work do I have to put in to get there? The interesting thing is as people develop some level of skill, it develops self-confidence. And then that confidence says, okay, I can probably do a little better. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you set the standard, and I'm not, this is the whole other topic you're talking about, how bad do you want it, sometimes is be off the charts for people. Well, I could never shoot like that. But maybe something simple. I'd like to be able to draw and put two hits into a target that big at seven yards in two seconds. That's doable. You can do that. But folks look at that and say, well, I can barely load the gun. Okay, well, we'll get there. And then maybe we can make that three shots when added a few more yards to the distance. But you got to get somewhere where you can develop some confidence in yourself and confidence in your what you're doing to train. One of the things I'm really kind of interested in academically, like one of the things I like to read about, I like mm -hmm. to talk about is, is performance, right? Like how do people become the outliers? How do sure. they become the high performers? And if you look at all the, the research in the last 10 years or so on like the plasticity of the brain, on deliberate practice, on how people get there, and they've pretty much discredited the 10,000 hours of practice thing. It's not, that's not what it's about. Yeah. I believe it. Guess what? A quick side note. I trained that one weekend with that 365. Yeah. I'm on the range today. My hands have been jacked up. I've been letting my hands heal. I go to the range today. I draw my 19, shoot, dump a mag. And did you watch how I was dumping the mags with that using this thumb mm -hmm. because the gun was so small? I brought that gun in and dumped the mag like this. And I laughed. I was like, like I shot this Glock a million times and I burned this in using this yep. thumb in two days of doing it over and over. Well, an interesting thing I read a couple years ago, and this is why you have to be careful. This is why you can't let my SWAT guys leave after pushing the limits. Mm. You don't necessarily react the way you've done the most of your training. A lot of times you react the way you did your last training. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah, I read a study on it. I, I forget where it was. I wish I could remember. But It's like at the top of the stack of data. Yeah, it's like your Rolodex in your head. Now, you know I'm old if I'm talking about a Rolodex. That's right? old. It's real old. <laughs> but uh, it's the card that's on top. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. So. That makes sense. I caught myself today and I told myself that's not how you do it. And I did it a few more times, you know, made my, my but, but I trained it in and that's the... Just a side note, that is the problem with going and training with 20 different guns every time you go to the range. Have one, train with it, stick to it. And that's, that's why I compete with a Glock. With the gun that you carry because on Because it's the gun I carry. Yep, yep. When I retire, that may change. Who knows? Yeah. Then I can have choices. But sure. I, don't think I'll have, I don't think I'll have a lot of different guns. I, I like having... It, it just makes life easier. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, it's hard enough, like distinguishing between AIWB off duty and strong side hip on duty, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And like, I made sure that like my holster at work for SWAT, it is a safari land, it does have retention, but it's in the exact same place as my competition holster. It sits mm -hmm. the exact same distance from my body, the same height, because that way I don't have to think about the difference. Mm -hmm. And because of the kind of holster it is, I can, it's just the thumb. You know, you hit the button and you're good. I put the, uh, there's a, a piece from Oregon Trail Defense that makes that, that thumb piece bigger. Mm -hmm. It's like set screws, aluminum, you put it on there. Interesting. It makes it much more reliable, easier to hit without defeating the purpose of having the retention. Sure. So I put that on there so that my draw for competition, my thumb goes in the same place anyway gotcha. to establish the grip. So it's fundamentally the same. And I've put them on the timer and it's, it averages about between one and three tenths different. Okay. So it's not a huge difference in draw speed between the two. And I did, I did all that on purpose because I wanted what I did in the matches to carry over to what I did mm -hmm. in work. But then it's hard enough doing that and also because I carry AIWB when I'm concealed. So it's a similar draw stroke, but it's not the same. So I gotta make sure I put enough reps on that. And, and those of like, you that don't know what that means, that's appendix inside the waistband. It's what all the cool kids are doing. Mm -hmm. It's very trendy, mm -hmm. very hot. So I just read the other day in a magazine, somebody wrote, I forgot what author it was, doesn't matter. He wrote, for those of you that have all this consternation about carrying here versus here, don't worry about it. When you need it, you'll remember where you put it. Yes, I do think that's true. 
but that doesn't mean your draw stroke will be as efficient if yeah. you haven't put in the reps. Yeah. Um, I do think they're similar. I think they're very similar. I know uh, Mike Pannone, a guy we mentioned before that I have a huge amount of respect for. Mm -hmm. Mike's solid. I mean, he's he has enough real world experience to be a legend among le like people who are legends in the community. He's a legend to them. And his take on it is that the draw stroke is similar enough that you don't need a huge amount of reps for carryover. But he'll say himself, you need the reps. It's sure. not, it is, you know, you're going here, you have to remember to clear the garment. The path to the gun is very similar. Gabe and I were talking about this. He uses that, uh, that claw grip, yeah. the IWB. <laughs> but the path up and in is very similar to the path up and in for here. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not drastically different, but I know that I don't feel comfortable unless I put in enough reps. Like right now I'm trying to get my speed on the AIWB from concealment down to the same speed as my, my competition holster. Working on it. Yeah, that's hard. It is. It is. But uh, it's one of my goals for the year. I want to do it. So I think that, and like also, like if I'm carrying AIWB, I'm going to dry that a couple of times if I've been carrying strong side hip at work all day. When I switch out, I'm at least going to put my hand on the gun. You know, I may not draw the gun if mm -hmm. it's hot, but I'm at least going to clear the garment, put my hand on the gun four or five times before I leave the office in civilian clothes. Sure. It's the same thing. You want that last card in the Rolodex. All right. There it is. There it is. Yep. Yep. And I think that it's, that's one of the dangers of having too many things, too many carry methods, mm -hmm. too many weapon systems. It's not that you can't be proficient with them all. It's how much time do you have? It also makes me think about what somebody's true goal is. Like, is it really to be good with that gun to protect your life or other innocent people? Or are you just like with a bunch of different guns? Because if you really wanted to be yeah. good at protecting your life, you wouldn't with a bunch of different guns. Yeah. No, you practice with what you carry, how you carry it. Right. I know guys that are like, well, this is my church gun. This is my movie theater gun. This is the gun I wear if I've got swim trunks on. Like, I get that. Like, there are certain times yeah. that I cannot have a full-size pistol on me. But for the most part, I always use the same gun. Yeah. Off-duty, I either carry 17 or 26, depending on, on how I'm dressed. And they're basically the same gun, just sure. one's a, a cut-down version of the mm -hmm. other. You got to see the one I just got from Ben from Boresight, my 26. I, I, saw, I saw the footage of it. It looked nice. Very <laughs> sexy. I shot, I shot the heck out of it today. It felt great. Uh, that's just, you know, that's one of those side notes, but I think those kind of things, people don't think about it, especially some of the folks that you guys, if you're listening to this, it might sound like it's not a big deal. Like, oh, what do they care what we're shooting? I don't care what you're shooting, but if your goal is to get better, you're not going to be playing around. Like, I've got way more guns than I need, but when I go to the range, I've got a gun, magazines, bullets. I think too, and to go back to the competition world for a minute, some of the top guys shoot across the divisions, right? They'll shoot different guns, different divisions, sure. and do very, very well. So people- And that's really to challenge themselves though. Well, people, people don't look at it the right way. Well, JJ does it, but JJ didn't get to be JJ by doing that. right? You know, we're, J.J. Rikaza, who's one of the world's very top shooters. You get to be that good by working on one system, one platform long enough to master it. And then you can pick up something else and you can learn it pretty quickly. Because he's got the skills not only to shoot, but also the skills to train himself yes. with a new platform. And I think you do yourself a disservice if you branch out before you get to... And like I said, mastery for you is mastery for you. It doesn't have to be... J.J. Right. Rikaza, Ben Steger, Robert Vogel. It's, it's whatever is good enough, good enough for you with that little bit of surplus for when things go bad. Mm -hmm. But until you get to that point, I, I would probably train on one gun until you get to that point and just really be solid with that one gun. John Bianchi, Bianchi Cup, Bianchi Holsters, he said, one gun, one holster, all the time. Mm -hmm. That was like his famous saying. and. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I cringe when I'll, I'll, I'll be in a class and I'll watch a student, I'll see that they've been shooting a whatever, a Glock 17, and then 
I see a Beretta in their hand. I'm like, what the hell happened to the gun you've been shooting the last 14 hours? Oh, I wanted to try this. And there might be some validity to that. Like, hey, I want to test this gun and see which one I like the best. But go ahead. Yes, but I would argue that a training class isn't the right place to be testing anything. I agree. I, I, would just, I mean, if, yeah. if I'm in the class, I want to learn everything I can. Yeah. So I don't want to be shooting an unfamiliar gun sure. or one that isn't reliable, one that I don't know is reliable. Are you talking about the 365 again? No, no, this, this isn't all about you. <laughs> I know, it's just I felt there was another place to, to shove it in there. But no, it's like, when I go to a training class, I don't want to be thinking about anything but what I can learn. Right. I don't have so, to be worried about my gear. And, no, yeah, no. It's, you know, how do I load this thing? Yeah, I want to try all that stuff out in practice. Yeah. Um, and kind of going back to what we were talking about a minute ago about not working on too many guns, like, because of, this is kind of going back to where I come from, right? Like, if you've got to be able to shoot with your pistol, with your carbine, with more special purpose rifles, with belt-fed machine guns, mm -hmm. with crew serve weapons, with, you know, all these different things, you're not going to want a bunch of options at each level. Yeah. You know, so you kind of, that's kind of what informed me on that. That makes good sense. But by, by people much more experienced than me, obviously, at the time, they kind of, you know, like, you know, no, man, just work on what you got to work on because you're not good at everything yet. Right. Get good at all this stuff first, and then if you're good enough, you can start playing around with things. But I think the same logic kind of holds true. I think that if, because look at the average CCW guy who wants to be equipped and trained well enough to take care of his loved ones, mm -hmm. right? It's not just running the gun he has to worry about. He has to worry about all those other things we talked about. The whole thought process, the environment. How do, how do I avoid the trouble if sure. I can? How do I put myself in the best place so if the trouble happens, I'm ready? Mm -hmm. What are all the tactical considerations? What are all the environmental considerations? What are the legal considerations? Mm -hmm. He's got to think about all those things too. So that unconscious competence we talked about I think is really important. And that's the easiest thing to get if you're only training one thing. Yeah. Like I said, at least you get to a certain point. When you yeah. get to a certain point, if your skill level is high enough and you want to have fun, then, then have fun. Yeah. But having fun isn't how you build that skill level. I, I don't mean it's not fun. The process is enjoyable, but you know what I mean. I know exactly. It's work. You know? Yeah. It is. It's work. Like folks will say to me, friends of mine will be like, hey, when's the next time you're at the range? I want to go. And I don't invite them. Because I know when they go to the range, it's jerk off time. But when I show up, like I've got a notebook, I've got a bottle of water, I got my shit, and I pull up, I dump all the crap onto the range. You do the same thing. So I, I gotta tell a story about a friend of mine. And if he hears this, he's gonna give me shit. But he's a good dude, so he'll have a sense of humor about it. I have a buddy named Richard. Um, he's from South Africa. Dick. You know his brother, I think. Okay. Yeah. Richard is a great guy. He's a great guy. He looks like a mad scientist. He wears a lab coat to work on the range. He's, he tinkers with guns. He's, he's great at reloading. He's great at, at gunsmithing. He's a good shooter. Richard is perhaps challenged in the area of attention span. Okay. A little bit. A little okay. bit. Um, I have never seen him consistently shoot more than three bill drills in a row with the right number of rounds. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, can't. It's like, I shot five again. Yes, Richard, you shot five again. I keep doing that. Yes, you do. I shot seven. Yes, you did, Richard. That's funny. So I love the guy. He's such a good guy. And I do enjoy shooting with him, but it's not training. Yeah. I'll never forget, I was going to go meet him at the range he works at, and we were going to practice. And I come out on the range, and he's got his homemade 10-millimeter Glock. Mm. And he's using the selfie video on his iPhone to do the Annie Oakley shot over his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, you have to try this. I'm like, no, I have things I want to work on. Right, I don't like, have to do this. I've, I've got a whole list of drills I need to do today. I don't have to do this I, at all. This doesn't help me. Right. And like, I love the guy. He's, he's a funny. fantastic guy. He's like, you have to try. No, I'm not trying that. I've got to work on what i got to work on. That's exactly the guy I'm talking about. So, and then like, hey, let's go get lunch. What? So Richard was stopping by the SWAT range, and I was at work. And we get a phone call, and... I'm out of the range practicing and get a knock on the door and one of the guys that works for me is like, hey, Richard's stopping by. He's going to shoot. I'm like, okay, yes, but tell him we're doing my drills on my timeline and we're not messing around. <laughs> and Richard shows up and he's like, 
you know, I'm not trying to intrude. I'm like, no, no, I want to shoot with you. I have a great time shooting with you, but I only have 30 minutes before I have to go train these guys. We're doing my drills on my timeline because the work's got to get done. Right. And we had fun. And there's nothing wrong with what, what he was doing because for him, that was the, the point of it was enjoying the shooting mm -hmm. and having a good time and seeing what he could do. And he's a very good shot. Where you or I enjoy that process of yeah. learning, growing. And he's certainly good enough. His skill level is high enough for anything he would ever need. But he's not chasing the dragon. Mm -hmm. right? you know, I'm, I'm chasing the dragon. I want to catch a certain skill level, and that's going to take conscious effort and conscious work and a plan. Sure. And that's the difference. You know, like I said, there's nothing wrong with that, especially because he's already built a high level of skill. So for him, it's, he, he's as good as he ever wants to be. He's maintaining it. Yeah, yeah. And that's okay. So I guess the lesson there is if you pick a level of skill that you feel like you're good enough at, once you get to that point, then you can kind of play if you want. If you're not interested in chasing the dragon any further. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not one of the guys that has to see how far down the rabbit hole goes, that's fine. And that brings up the, the main point is what is your goal? You know, most folks go get a gun and I'll ask them, what's your goal in training? Well, to be able to protect myself. What does that look like? And you have to be able to quantify and codify some of those things in some way, shape or form, which, which I hear two sides of this. Some dudes say, you don't need to go pay for professional training. There's plenty of videos or you can go and you, you hear how you started this going down different avenues that went to nowhere, Bill. It would make sense to me to go spend a thousand bucks, take a couple classes with somebody that can say, this makes sense, this makes sense, that makes sense, and then I don't waste thousands of rounds. And uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 very famous shooter, Ipsic guy, for, he's still competing and he's still in phenomenal shape. His name is, uh, oh, my brain went blank. He said for years he shot a million rounds before he ever taught himself how to actually train, how to shoot a, a, a pistol. He was, he's a GM for years. His name will pop in my head in a minute. But he talks about it. That's like how he opens classes up. I, sh I figured I shot a million rounds and put a million bullets into the burn before I ever actually really started to understand how I was teaching myself. Yeah, that's, that I think is really important. And like, there's a couple of examples there, right? Like uh, Ben's latest edition of his book, his live fire book. He has a drill in that book. And when you, when you read it, you can understand what the drill is. You can understand what he's saying the purpose of the drill is. Okay. But it wasn't until the next time I shot with him after the book came out that I really understood intuitively what he was looking at when he shot the drill. I see. How he was getting better. And I think a lot of us will look at like, oh, I'll pull a competition benchmark out, right? Oh, I need to do a bill drill in under two seconds. Um, bill drill is from the holster, six rounds to the A zone, seven yards. Seven right? yards, yep. So I need, a, I need a two second bill drill because that's what they say the standard is. So you get out there and you shoot thousands of rounds on the bill drill and you're just trying to get faster and trying to get more accurate, but mm -hmm. you don't yet understand what you need to experiment with right. to make it faster, right. to make it more accurate. Where is my gun coming up to as what, what are the nuances of my grip? Mm -hmm. how, how has my draw got to look? Um, what are my sights doing as they track? Mm -hmm. Like those things are very hard to figure out. Am I even own. paying attention to them tracking? Yeah. Or am I just seeing yeah. a blur of yeah. muzzle out there? There's a bunch of flame. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> For sure. I see this thing moving and it's spitting fire and mm -hmm. like there's holes appearing. It's yeah. true though. It is true. It's absolutely true. And I think that learning how to learn this stuff is more difficult than people think. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard people say that in many ways, shooting a pistol especially, much more so than a carbine, is, is counterintuitive because you're controlling the small explosion in front of your face. And this thing is moving what, it's not violent, but it appears to be more violent than say a carbine, right? Sure. It's more of a perceived amount of recoil. Yeah. It's harder to control. It's harder to be accurate with it because of the sight radius. There's a lot of things going on that you have to figure out that happen in a very compressed time frame, And it's very hard to learn how to learn to do those things right. And I think that going and getting somebody to help you kind of shortcut that process is invaluable. And quite honestly, I wish I could have done it decades ago. I wish I started competing decades ago because I'd be, I don't know if I would be further along, but I would have been further along a lot earlier and okay. would have made things a lot easier. 
You know? Yeah, like man. It, it's, it's a difficult thing to figure out on your own. I'm not saying it can't be done. Yeah, it can why certainly you, be why done. Would, and why would you do it if you don't have to? Why, why work harder than you have to? Yeah. You got to get where you're going sooner if you ask for help. And that's what, that's what a, a good teacher does. And that's people that have already done that work. Go seek them. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important, too. Like, this is another thing that gets debated a lot that I think really... It's kind of the crux of one of the debates, I think, in the tactical side of things. Is like... Real world experience, vice, like competitive experience, right? And we were talking about this about somebody we know earlier, about how this is a guy who's never been in a gunfight, mm -hmm. he's never been in the military. Um, Gabe White, we were talking about him earlier, he's a phenomenal instructor. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from him and would happily go train with him every chance I got because sure. his class is really Likewise. good. And some people critique him because he's never done the real thing. Mm -hmm. Then you have other guys that say a policeman who's been in a couple of armed encounters and prevailed, you may not know, and I'm not, I am not by any means knocking real world experience. Don't get me wrong at all. Real world experience is invaluable in so many ways. Sure. Um, and I wouldn't trade my time in group or my time as a cop for anything because I did learn a huge amount from that. But the learning doesn't happen in a vacuum of the armed encounter. Because the armed encounter is a fraction of time under high stress, compressed time frames, a lot of things are going on. You may not know why you won. Mm -hmm. Why you won may not be statistically repeatable. You know, there, there's a huge amount of luck involved mm -hmm. in all of those things, no matter how good you are. So I think that both things are very important. I think you need to seek out people that have the real world experience because you can learn so much from them about what they did and how they did it and why they did it, especially guys that have a lot of experience. So there's guys out there who have a lot of experience. That's of huge value, but I think that it's also of value to seek out guys like Gabe or guys like Ben, mm -hmm. guys who've done the competition side of things to a high level because they know how to run that gun. Yeah. They've delved so far into that, into the efficiency of it, and how to train for it. And that's got just as much value as, like, they both are important. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, neither one is without value. I think you need to find people that, from either side of the house, and learn from them. That's No, it makes good yeah. sense. And again, it begs the question of what's the goal? Yeah, And so if, if your goal is to learn how to shoot efficiently and proficiently, safely, there's a million dudes that can teach you to do that. If your goal is to become the dragon tail catcher, yeah. there's not a lot of dudes that are going to teach you to do that. There's a handful of people and then you got to have the drive and the wherewithal and the time and the finances to go chase that. I think too, though, is, and here's another way both sides are important, I think, right? You go to somebody like Ben, you go to somebody like Robert Vogel, you go to these guys that have followed that athletic pursuit as far as it can go. You don't necessarily go to them because you want to be them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I do, but that's not everybody, right? You go to them because they have learned how to train that. Yeah. They have learned how to get there. So obviously, even if you don't want to go as far down that road as them, They've got the roadmap. Mm -hmm. You don't have to take the road till it ends, mm -hmm. but you can take the road as far as you need to, sure. and they'll get you there quicker. And then the other side, like if you're a businessman who carries to protect your family, you're not going to be at Fallujah or Tora Bora, right? That's not what you're training for. Mm -hmm. But the guys that have done the deed can give you insights and how to prepare yourself for what is your worst day. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just the same thing. It's a road that you don't have to go all the way down. But if you only want to go down this far and they've gone to the end of the trail, that's still the roadmap you have to follow. So that's why I think you need both sides. I think if they've got the roadmap, you don't have to take the road till it ends. Yeah. You just take it as far as you want to go. Well, soon enough, people will be able to come see you for a map. M map maker, cartographer, uh, cartographer Matt. 
Here there be dragons? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, 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 a good ending point for the chat. We, uh, we covered a lot of ground there. What's some parting words you'd like to leave our listeners and viewers with? Don't take any wooden nickels. So, and like I said, this isn't about how, you know, how good you think you need to be is how good you think you need to be. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has to have this be this defining all intensive pursuit, right? Yeah. Balance it with the rest of your life. Take it for what you need. But one of my favorite quotes from martial arts is from a, a samurai called Miyamoto Masashi. He's one of the most famous samurai in Japan, right? And what he said was, the way is in training. There is a satisfaction to the pursuit of excellence. And like I said, you don't have to take it any further than your life allows, any further than you need to, but excellence for you. Mm -hmm. You set that benchmark and then training for that kind of becomes its own reward. Yeah. It becomes kind of this, this pursuit in and of itself that you can balance with everything else. You do sure. it as much as you think you need to, but it becomes as enjoyable or actually I think, to me at least, more enjoyable than going to the range and messing around. Mm -hmm. Because you're actually, you leave the range feeling like you accomplished I agree. something solid. Right. So that's, that's probably my parting words right there. I like it. If, uh, for now, if people want to get a hold of you, they can go to Instagram. Yep. At? Uh, graybeardactual.com. Is there an underscore in there? Or anything? Yeah, there is. Yeah, graybeard underscore actual. Um, I've actually had a website okay, it's coming up. out. It's not up yet. Okay. Um, the Coming Soon page is up. Um, a shooter we both know is actually working on it for Cool. Me, Matt Koyak. Um, Gray, that'll be graybeardactual.com. No yep. spaces. No, no underscore, just graybeardactual.com. Mm -hmm. um, the Instagram is at graybeard underscore actual. Very cool. Guys, I hope you uh, appreciated the time we spent here. If you have questions on any of it, you know how to get a hold of me. If you go to Matt's Instagram page, I'm sure you can send him a DM. Uh, check him out there. Follow him. Look for more stuff from him. If you're in the region that we're in, I'm not going to tell you where exactly that is. Maybe you'll see him on, a, on a, a, a match range or training range. And we'll hope to see you again soon. If you're not yet subscribed to this channel, whichever one you're watching this on, please do share it with your friends and family because it's important because we're important and we're taking our free time to share this shit with you. On that note, I'm gonna say goodbye. Good night, everybody. Visit our website, carrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the US, Carry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at carrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com.